can turn your Bibles to John chapter 1. That's what we will be looking at this morning as we consider God's Word. Again, thank you all for being here. It's good so many of you could make it. Especially, it's good to see so many of the students back. Uh, and we want you to know we delayed potluck one week just for you all. So please, please stay. I also want to thank the worship team for doing double duty. This morning, uh, some Stephanie could not make it in, so I told them we would double their pay. Um, <laughs> it won't affect the church budget much at all. And then, also I want to thank uh, Tim Ricker. He was actually supposed to preach this morning, but because our Presbytery meeting got canceled because of the snow, he very graciously agreed to switch dates with me so that I could preach this morning, and then he'll preach when, when I go to Presbytery in a couple of weeks, Lord willing. So now we're, we're back to the Gospel of John, and we are going to read chapter 1, verse 35, and we're just going to go through verse 46, 35 through 46. So let's hear God's word for us this morning. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip is from Bethsaida the city of Andrew and Peter, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, of Moses in the law, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our God and Father, we do ask that you would bless our time in your word, that you would make it clear to us, that uh, it would be explained accurately, but more than that, and on top of that, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would apply it effectually to our lives, that we would come and see Jesus, and that we would follow him more closely. We ask this in his name. Amen. Like many of you, I suspect that you have a number of deck of cards uh, in your house, like we do. Uh, we not only have normal decks of cards, but we actually have several specialty decks that we've picked up over the years. For instance, here's a deck of cards from based on Tintin, or Tintin, if you prefer the French. If you don't know who that is, well, shame on you. You ought to. <laughs> Uh, then there's this deck of cards that I literally bought in Paris about 30 years ago, which is based upon all the generals and marshals of Napoleon. Really cool, right? I know a number of you are coveting after this deck of cards. <laughs> but our favorite was this one with the various kings and queens of England, which is a really excellent way to learn about the different monarchs. And as you may know, most of the kings and queens simply have a number after their name, like Mary II, or, um, or Queen Elizabeth II, I should say, or uh, Henry VIII. I knew when I got Mary II, that was wrong. Queen Elizabeth II, Henry VIII. But then there's some other literal titles, uh, most of which, or many of which you probably know. For instance, William the Conqueror, you've heard of him, right? Uh, or Richard the Lionhearted. But here's some you probably don't know, the three Edwards. There is Edward the Elder, Edward the Martyr, and Edward the Confessor. You don't want to mix those up. You want to keep your Edward straight. But here's my favorite King of England with a special title, Ethelred the Unready. <laughs> How would you like to be called that? <laughs> but what if you were given an additional name, an extra title? 
what would it be? What would you want it to be? And I don't mean the title that goes before your name, like professor or dentist or UPS driver, something like that. No, I mean something about you, something that describes your character. What would it be? Well, that is what happens to Peter in our text this morning. And I would argue it happens to us as well as we come to Christ. So as I mentioned, we are starting back again in the Gospel of John. And so today we actually begin to look at the start of Jesus' ministry when he begins to call his disciples to follow him. Up until now, it's largely been prologue, uh, getting us ready for Jesus' ministry. But still, it's been all about Jesus so far. Uh, already we have seen that Jesus is called the Word of God. He is the light. He is the light. He is the only Son of the Father. He is the only God. John tells us he is the Lamb of God and he is the Son of God. And then through the rest of uh, the chapter, we're going to learn five more titles about Jesus. This chapter is all about who Jesus is, and we've just begun the gospel. And so having already learned in, in the prologue that Jesus is the one who alone is both fully God and fully man, the, the one who alone reconciles the world to God, we now turn to see uh, that Jesus begins to gather people around him. Because Christ came, uh, God became flesh to reconcile the world to his Father. That looks like something. It's not just a concept. It's not just a, an idea that you accept. No, it, what does it look like? Well, it's something we call the church. He gathers people around himself into a community of the saved. And so we begin to see him gathering the church. And that's what the rest of the New Testament is about, by the way. The church being gathered as the people hear the grace of Jesus Christ and come and put their faith in him. And then they join Christ's body. So we begin in verse 35. And what do we see? Uh, very Right away, we, we, there's an observation. The next day, again, John was standing. Now, that little phrase, the next day, is actually important. Because it tells us that we're looking at Jesus' first week of ministry. Uh, it began, I think, in verse 29, and then there's several places where John the Gospel writer says, the next day, the next day, until chapter 2. He says, the third day, Jesus went to a wedding. And this is important because he ends his Gospel, beginning with chapter 12, with Jesus' last week of earthly ministry before the resurrection. And now he's telling us about the, the very first week of Jesus' ministry. So there's something important here about what Jesus did. We're following Jesus and how he began his ministry day by day. Second, from verse 35, notice how John the Baptist right off sets the tone for the passage. John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So here is John, who remember, Jesus himself called the greatest man who had ever lived up until this point. He was the only prophet in, in over 400 years' time. Uh, there had been complete silence, and then finally God raised up John to be the, the final prophet. He led a great revival and a huge following throughout Israel. But what does John do? He takes his two disciples and he points them away from himself, and he points them to Jesus Christ. Now, some of you all lead Bible studies, or you at least have friends that you uh, try to encourage in Christ and to help grow in Christ. I hope all of you have that, right? That's how we grow, is this mutual encouragement. Do you follow John's example here and point people away from yourself and to Christ? I mean, even if you can set an example for them, which the apostles do, which Paul says he does, follow my example, he says, as I follow Christ. You're pointing them, if you will, to yourself, but through yourself to Jesus Christ. I mean, what is, what is the goal of your leadership and of your friendship? It, it could be to try to get a following for yourself. That can kind of be fun. Or you can follow John's example and take every opportunity to point people to Jesus. That's why John, the gospel writer, has already given Jesus all of these titles. He is always the focus of all true spiritual growth. I mean, this makes sense, right? I mean, we, we do need a man to follow. We do need someone like us that we can know and relate to. We are not saved by principles. We're saved by a person. And, and so we all, everyone's looking for this. And that's why people are so prone to hero worship, either in religion or in politics or in sports, where they just find these idols that they just want to 
get, or, or in music, that they want to get close to and maybe touch and get their signature. And uh, I remember several years ago, my family were, we were visiting New York City, and we had a wonderful time. Uh, we were spending time at Times Square and other places, but as we got home that night to my brother-in-law's house, I saw on the internet that the women's soccer team had just come back from the World Cup. This is the one where they finished second. And we, they came to Times Square just a few minutes after we were there, and we were devastated because we wanted to see them. They were our heroes. And so some further research on the internet revealed that they were going to be on the David Letterman show uh, the next day, at least two of them, Abby Wambach and Hope Solo. So we did everything we could. We, 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 we scheduled our whole day around stalking Abby and Hope Solo. <laughs> and indeed, we got there. We found out they were going to do some sort of skit outside, something about kicking soccer balls into moving taxi cabs. And we saw them do that. And then somebody in the know told us they're going to leave through the side door. So we ran around to the side street and went to the side door so we could perhaps touch the hem of their garments. <laughs> there is this big, burly security man. And he said, well, they're going to come out of that door over there. So we went, oh, we went, like, we got right, right in the face of that door. The doors have faces. And he was lying to us. And that was his job, to get the crowds away from where they really came out. So they snuck out somewhere else. But we almost touched them. We saw them. It was nice. Um, well, look, we all have people like that. But there's only one man who is perfect. There's only one man who can connect us <coughs> to God unfailingly. And that, that man is God himself. And so this is Jesus Christ. So always, this is what John the Baptist does. Always point people away from yourself and to Jesus Christ, who alone has all power and grace to save. And so that's what John says in verse 36. What's the thing he says? Behold the Lamb of God. Yes, this is God's own son. Yes, he is the king of Israel. He's very God of very God, but he comes first as a lamb. He comes as one who is gentle. He came not to condemn the world, but to save the world for all who would trust in him. And so as you know, that he came not just to be gentle, but to be that sacrifice for the sins of the world. Now, I think John's disciples would have understood this, at least eventually. This exact phrase, the Lamb of God, is found nowhere in the Old Testament. And that's important, actually. But they knew what lambs were for, how they were symbolically used to pay for the sins of Israel. That, 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 that the, the prophets and the priests told God's own people, you all need sin atoned for. And so these animals are sacrificed in your place to point to the greater sacrifice. So here comes, finally, the promised Messiah. And John's first thing that he says is, he is the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. The final Lamb. He's not just a Lamb, he's the Lamb of God. And so John's disciples understand this. And eventually they will see that Lamb upon a cross. You all understand this, right? You all understand what it means for Jesus to be your Lamb. That if you have trusted in Him... All your sins are fully paid for, and your eternal life is guaranteed and secure. That's why we're here this morning, to remember that, and, 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 and to do all we can to be part of God getting that message out to those who do not know it yet. He is the Lamb of God. He is our only hope. And so notice what John's disciples then do. I think it's verse 37. Immediately, they start to follow Jesus John, John the Baptist would be like, wait a minute, I just was pointing him out to you. No, no, John is happy. We know this from chapter 3. Go, follow this lamb. And so, verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Now, this is, this is one of those verses that preachers can over-preach. Now, they can say, look, these guys left everything to follow Jesus, so all of y'all need to quit school, sell everything, and go be a missionary somewhere. And maybe there are some folks who are to do that if God calls them to and as confirmed by the church. But this is a descriptive verse. Do you all understand the difference? A prescriptive verse is a command that we all have to follow. This is just a description of what happened in history. It's what happened that day. It doesn't mean these two disciples gave up their families or their jobs. It just meant that day they literally started to, to walk after Jesus. All right? I mean, look at the very next verse, 38. Jesus turned, and he saw them following, and he said to them, what are you seeking? So this is how it happened, plain and simple. But I, I do think there's something symbolic here. I do think John, the gospel writer, is beginning his gospel with this on purpose for us as an example. After all, 
Look at the very first words of Jesus recorded for us in the Gospel of John. That's verse 38. Uh, I mean, for instance, if you had a red letter edition, you would not see any red until this verse. And what does Jesus say to these two men? What are you seeking? Or as some translations put it, what do you need? What are you after? Isn't that sweet? But that's Jesus' first words to us in the Gospel of John. I mean, in one way, of course, this just happened. These two guys are following you. Imagine if someone's following you in the streets of Blacksburg. You're going to turn around. What do you want? Maybe that's what's going on. But I think there's more here, right? What are you seeking? What can I do for you? What are you longing for? And then it just gets even more sweet. I, I don't know whether the disciples were taken aback and didn't know what to say, so they just kind of stammered out, oh, where are you staying? Or what they're saying is, we want to know what you're saying so we can come and get to know you. You're the Lamb of God. Our mentor, our prophet has pointed us to you. We want to know where you're staying so we can get to know you. Rabbi, where are you staying? And Jesus answers accordingly, come and you will see. I mean, he could have just given them a bunch of theological answers and then gone on his way, right? He's, he's all truth. It, it would have been astounding, whatever he said, but instead he says, come and see. Come, spend time with me. And so John tells us they did that, and it was the tenth hour of the day, which means it was four o'clock. That's the way they numbered the hours back then. And they, so that means it was dinner time. So they came and they apparently spent the evening with him. Wouldn't that be amazing to be able to spend an evening with Jesus? Can you imagine such a thing? Being able to sit down with Jesus. Well, you know what? You can. And even more. Because here's the thing. Even though this, this is just history, this is what happened the, first, the second day of Jesus' public ministry, I do think it's something symbolic for us to consider. I mean, how do you spend time with Christ? I mean, think, think about your life and how God has worked in your life. Who is the John the Baptist in your life? Was there a point in your life where someone pointed you beyond themselves into Christ? I, I know who it was for me. It was for my parents when they came to Christ when I was 10. And then later my brother when he was converted as a freshman in college. And then my youth leaders at 4th Presbyterian when I joined that church. And they, they started teaching me about Jesus. And then I... Did you then, as being pointed to Christ, then did you start to look into him, maybe following him from a distance, trying to figure out who he was? I remember that in my life, too, when I was a young teenager, reading the Chronicles of Narnia, which I know are not the Bible, but they're really close, right? <laughs> and, and, and just the, the grace in those novels, and wanting to have a personal relationship with God, and then later reading the Bible every day until finally the Holy Spirit showed me I was a sinner. Oh, I was a religious kid. But I didn't understand the gospel until I learned I was a sinner. And so I was following him from a distance. And then at one point, when I was about 17, Jesus said, come and see more. Come and learn from me. Come and receive my grace. Has he done that for you? Come, and you will see. Come, spend time with me. And that's what you've been doing ever since you've come to Christ. For those of you who have come to Christ, every time you open your Bibles, Every time you pray in distress or even in joy, every time you come to worship, that's why you're here. You're, you're, you're coming and staying with Jesus. You're coming and spending time with him, and he is teaching you about himself, and he is mysteriously giving you more of himself as his word is preached, and you receive it by faith, and you confirm it in the sacraments. You're receiving more of Christ. Jesus invites you into his life. He meets with you. He doesn't just give you a, a bunch of facts to memorize. You're saved by being united to Christ and knowing him. That is eternal life, he tells us in chapter 17. <clears throat> so don't think you have it worse off than these two disciples. Oh, you have it better. I, I think that's why John starts Jesus' ministry that way, that we also, even though we're not these two disciples, we also would be invited into a life of salvation and discipleship <clears throat> Through Christ, But there, there are two more things about this first section I want us to notice. And it has to do with the names of these disciples. Let's take a look. First look at verse 40. Uh, we read that one of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. All right, now let's, 
We, we had to learn Andrew's name because he's one of the 12 apostles. And he has a really cool flag later on in church history. But that's <laughs> we, we have to know who Andrew is. But what's the other guy's name? Look, look at the text. And we never learn his name. What do you think of that? Uh, a few years ago, my girls and I were watching a, a Tom Hanks movie called That Thing You Do, which is about an early or late 1950s <coughs> rock and roll band. It's really about the marketing of <coughs> rock and roll early. And, and we liked it so much that we actually watched it twice in a row on the same afternoon. It's the only movie we've ever done that. It wasn't that good, but they wanted to do that. And one thing I remember about that movie, of course, is there's the lead singer, there is the guitarist, there is the bass player. But then there was the series of drummers that the band kept rotating through, and you never learn their names. In fact, in the credits at the end, it just said drummer one, drummer two, drummer three. <laughs> How would you feel if you were that drummer? And Kim, we do give you credit, and thank you for playing this morning. <laughs> you can't have a band without a drummer. So back to John. If I were that nameless guy, the friend of Andrew's, and I was still alive when John's gospel came out, and I'm sitting in a church somewhere, and someone's reading this holy scripture, and as soon as we got to verse 35, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and I was one of those guys, and I just couldn't wait till my name came up. Talk about me. But then I would never get mentioned. <clears throat> And so the point is this, this man is precious in God's sight. He was saved just as much as Andrew and Peter were. And yet we never learn his name. And that's us. You are precious in God's sight. And yet your name never makes it into the Holy Scriptures. And as far as the world goes, most of you will not be well known at all. But God still loves us. And here's the thing. And this is why I think John includes this. He might have known this guy's name and purposely left it out. Because it's not about us. It's not about Andrew or Peter or this nameless guy. Of course, who is it about? It's about Jesus. And that's the point, I think. But secondly, there's something even more interesting about the names of these first disciples, and that's what happens with Peter. We read in verse 41 that Andrew goes and he finds his brother Simon, that's what his name was at the time, and he says to him, we have found the Messiah. Now, we're going to get some more detail about Peter's first encounters with Jesus in the other Gospels. But remember, John, I believe, knew what the other Gospels said, and we don't need to know all that for his purposes. He's writing more of a theological account. This is what we need to know for his purposes. So Andrew introduces his brother to Jesus. Apparently, in those few hours, he learned enough from John the Baptist and enough from sitting with Jesus to know this man is the promised Messiah. Uh, most of you know what that word means, and, and, and as John tells us, which means Christ. That's the Greek. You see how several times here John translates Aramaic or Hebrew words into the Greek. But it really ought to be the Christ. Jesus is the anointed one, where several times in the Old Testament, the one that's promised to come to be the Savior is called the anointed one, the special one from God. He's the Savior they've all been waiting for, and Andrew tells Simon, I have found him. And so what does he do? Verse 42. He brings Simon to Jesus. Now, this is one of those other verses which can be over-preached by preachers. And I'm going to do exactly that. <laughs> Look, have you met Jesus? Have you gone through that story that we talked about earlier? Have you been convinced that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, that you're going to live forever, and yet you're still here on earth? He hasn't taken you home yet. You're not yet perfected. You not yet have entered into your eternal rest. Well, then do you do what Andrew did? Do you tell your brother about Jesus? And for some of you, I mean literally. Some of you have brothers and sisters that do not know Christ. Have you told them about it? If God works first and foremost through families, have you done what you can to bring them to Christ? Now, I don't mean convert them or convince them. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But I do mean to bring your family members to places where they can learn about Jesus, invite them to church, tell them about what he's done for you and what he means to you. 
How else will they believe unless they hear? And who better to hear it from than that sinner that they grew up with all of their life? They know everything bad about you. And yet you can tell them that you are yet forgiven. And now you're changed by the grace of God. Do you do what Andrew does? Do you bring your family members to come and meet with Christ? You know, that's why when I often meet with, with you all one-on-one, -on -one, when I'm first getting to know you, maybe at River Coffee at No Mountain, or when you come and join the church and meet the elders, we often ask you, tell us about your, your family. Tell us about your brothers, your sisters, <laughs> your parents. Do they know Christ? How can we pray for you? What's a way that we can see the kingdom grow through your families? Many of you are recipients, like I was, about God working first in someone else's life. But for others of you, you're the first ones. Do what Andrew did. Bring them to Christ. So let's get back, though, to, to Peter's name. Notice what Jesus does with him. He says, where is this? Verse 42. He says, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Jesus just changes <laughs> Peter's name right off, right at the start of, the ministry, of his ministry. Now, the other Gospels are going to build upon this, but John tells us that Jesus does this right at the start. And that's what Jesus does when he meets us. He changes us. Again, this really happened in Jesus' first week, but I think it's symbolic for all of us. Uh, and first of all, notice that I said that Jesus changed Simon's name, but that's not quite true, is it? He added to it, uh, which is why most often in the Gospels, Peter is called Simon Peter, both names together. And I think that's important. And secondly, though, we have to ask why Jesus did this. A Simon or Shimeon in Hebrew is a very common name, and it literally meant he heard or listening. Maybe some of you want to name your children that whenever you try to correct them. Uh, it's a perfectly good name. Some say that it had a, an aspect of a wind-like aspect to it. He's listening or, or blowing in the wind uh, so that Simon really means weak reed. And so the idea here is that Jesus changes his name to rock. You know what that's what Petros means. It means rock. So Jesus is changing Peter from this bending, susceptible reed to a solid person built upon grace. Now, no one believes, or they ought not to believe, that Peter is strong of himself. Uh, you read Luke 5, and as Peter meets Jesus again, he says, Lord, get away from me, for I am a sinful man. And then Jesus says, get up, Peter. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Oh, we understand Peter is only made strong by the grace of God that's given to him. J David just taught us two Sunday school lessons on that. We understand that. And so that's possible what Jesus is doing here. This is what I taught for years until I did a more careful word study of the name Simon. But even, look, even if Simon just means he's listening or he heard, it still, it still makes Peter this rock standing on grace. How? Well, because G Peter heard the words of Jesus. And then he becomes Simon Peter. He who hears and then becomes strong. So again, this is for us too. No, we don't become an apostle. I don't want to pretend that. We don't become the foundation of the church, which they were along with the prophets. But here's the point I think John's trying to make. You don't meet Jesus savingly without him changing you. It's the same pattern as this, that he does not take away your first name. You stay the same person with the same interests and talents, at least if they're wholesome, right? But then Jesus adds his life to yours. So in a sense, he does add to your name. You remain the same person, but then he adds to your name. So you're no longer just Frank or Matilda. Now you are Frank the Gracious in Christ. Uh, you are Matilda the Strong in Christ. You're the same people, but now you are in Christ and he adds to you. I mean, so what has that been for you? Maybe some of you are unfaithful in your relationships. But now you are the faithful one in Christ, by God's grace. Maybe some of you are a bit rough around the edges and pretty grumpy and have a huge temper. But now you're, let's say, you're Juan, the gentle. Uh, others of you might have been cowards. But now you're Stella, the brave in Christ. You see how this works. And none of this is perfect. You're gonna, whatever it is that you struggled with that brought you to Christ, I, 
pretty sure you're going to struggle with it the rest of your life. Because that thing keeps bringing you back to Christ for his forgiveness and his grace. And that then, as you come back to him in humility, saying, Lord, I blew it again. Then he gives you more of his grace because you are humbling yourself and he's exalting you. And you have more of his character, more of his gentleness, more of his humility, and more of his boldness. Because you're standing upon Christ, the ultimate rock. And you must remember what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, even as you struggle, that you have been given a new name. That therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You have been changed. God looks upon you with all of the grace that is yours through Christ. He looks at you through the lens of his Son, and he gives you that new name. You are beloved. You are his adopted son or daughter. Whatever it is you struggle with. Whatever it is that brought you to Christ. He changes your name. And makes you new. Because here's the thing. Remember when we asked what this passage is really all about? It's not about Peter. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. Jesus and his authority to rename us. I mean, who does this? Who renames somebody the first time you meet them? Maybe when you go off to boot camp, some of you cadets, uh, you'll run into some sergeant that gives you a nickname that sticks with you. And that's, that's their way of showing their authority over you. But it only lasts for a couple of months, right? Then you have to shed them. Right, Jesus comes and he renames us, and that his names last forever. I mean, have you ever renamed anyone? And I don't mean parents picking a name for the first time. I mean renaming them. And I don't mean renaming yourself like you Quentin children, renaming yourself every couple of years, just, just as I memorized all your names. You changed your names on me. I, I wanted to find each of you. Uh, no, I mean, have you ever just come up to someone and given them a new name? I, I, the only time I've done that was with our doll. I think I have the authority to rename our doll, right? At least according to the law. Uh, her name is Caitlin. She's since uh, passed away. But her name is Caitlin. And one year, she was, one day, one year, she was sitting in her crate, and she was making an awful racket, and when we came down to finally get out of her crate, we found a dead bat inside the crate. A bat had flown into the crate, and she had dutifully killed it. And so I renamed her Caitlin Batspain. <laughs> I think I used it maybe once in her life, but you see, I had the authority to do that. No, we don't have the authority to do this with people. <laughs> Because we are not God. But Jesus is the king of the world and God in the flesh. And his renaming Peter shows his authority over Peter's life, his loving authority. And so that's where John goes from there. As we close, John, where is this? Verse 43. The next day, here's the next day, the third day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said, follow me. Who does this? Well, God does this. He has the authority. Because he has the authority to rename Peter, he has the authority to command Nathaniel or Philip to follow him. And so we can take, I think, one of two approaches to this text. We can emphasize what these disciples did, how they chose to follow Christ, and how we all need to do the same. I could preach this text and say, are you following Jesus closely enough? And the answer, of course, is no. Or and I can put a great burden on you to follow him more closely, which, of course, you must. Or we can remember the focus of this text itself which is on Jesus' authority to call followers to himself. And that's why he says to Andrew and the other disciple, come and see, come and learn, come and stay with me. And that's why we see the same thing down in verse 47. When Philip goes to tell his friend Nathaniel about the Messiah. You see the pattern here. Andrew goes and tells Peter. And Philip now goes and tells Nathaniel. But now he says, look, where it's 45, we have found him of whom Moses and the law, that's what we read in Deuteronomy 18. This is the one who was promised to us. We found him, and he's got a name, Jesus of Nazareth. But yet Nathaniel meets him with skepticism. He says, can anything good come from there? And we'll talk about that more next week. But now listen to how Philip responds. Can anything good come from Nazareth? What does Philip say? Come and see. Nathaniel, it's not about your ability to follow Jesus. But come and see. You see how that's repeating the very same thing Jesus said? Uh, Philip is already imitating Jesus without even knowing it. So it's not how much about how well we can follow Jesus. 
It's how much we can come and see Jesus and learn from him. You want to follow Jesus better? Then come to him and receive his grace. See him, learn from him, dwell with him. And he will give you more of himself and you will be able to follow him better. That's where it starts. Not by gutting it out, not by trying to be a better Christian by yourself, but just coming more to Christ. That's what this text is all about. That's what the gospel is all about. And it's what you're doing. You're praying, you're studying, you're coming to worship, you're listening to God's word, and you're looking to Christ by faith, trusting him. Whatever your doubts are, whatever your struggles are, he is your savior, and you want more of him. It's exactly what we then also invite others to. Is there someone you know who needs to come to Christ? Well, look, you don't have to convert them. You can't convert them. But you can do what you did. You can just tell them to come and see Invite them to your meetings. Invite them to your Bible studies. Just hang out together. Invite them to come into the life of believers and the life of the church and bring them to church. It's a neglected form of evangelism. Bring them to the body of Christ. They may not like all of it, but bring them so that they can come and see and meet Jesus and by his grace also get their name changed and hear the gospel and believe the Holy Spirit works. And live forever with God. That's what it's all about. That's why we're still here. That we might imitate Andrew. That we might imitate Philip. And say to those in our life. Come. And see. Let's pray. Our God and Father. We thank you for our Lord Christ. We thank you that he comes to us gently. Calling us himself, calling us that we might see him more, and that we might love him more. Lord, we know our failings, but we have already confessed our sins and know we are forgiven, so just help us to follow after Christ more closely, to see him more. Lord, you need to do this by your Holy Spirit. Our faith is weak, but you are strong. And we pray then that having done that, having rested on Christ once more, you might Open our eyes to those around us who also need to come and see. I, Lord, I pray in particular for these other brothers and sisters from other churches. Would you bless them? Help them to invite others to their churches, that their churches might, might grow, that people would come and see Jesus through them. I thank you for that. And now, bless the rest of our day in Christ's name. Amen.